Hello everyone, I'm just going through some of the notes that um, we did on the Tuesday and Thursday sessions. I've got to apologise for being a bit slow on this. Um, I did mean to get this all done and upload them further, but I've had sort of a lot of other work on. Anyway, the sort of big distinction between this week and last week is last week we all I spoke about the theory behind fuzzing, or well, at least instrumented fuzzing, and sort of went through the history of it as well, you know, starting with a sort of original dumb mutation engines that just threw data at a you know data at a function to see if it would react differently then we went on to the generational and evolutionary based fuzzing where you you know sort of give it a configuration file or a model file um you know just to you know to try and you know actually be able to access the data or sorry be able to execute more code within the program itself as opposed to you know just throwing random data that always gets rejected and then I went on to talking about instrumented fuzzing, which is sort of where fuzzing is now. Um, it's sort of, you know, not even the most modern techniques you can use, but everything seems to be based these days, at least on this sort of concept of, you know, checking which code paths you go down. And if you've ever seen something like Binary Ninja or Ida or Ghidra, and you've got these code blocks, and you've got these little blocks or nodes, and you've got these little edges or arrows, the idea is, is about putting detection mechanisms on these arrows, you know, and and these blocks to check which direction you're going down. So that was all last week, and I sort of taught you about AFL. Now, AFL was sort of the original thing that started doing this. Yes, there was code tracing around before, but I never... Like, AFL was the thing that really penetrated the market and changed everything. And AFL is a tool that is limited in some ways and that it sort of is based around, you know, programs that, you know, accept a file or accept standard input and you want to mutate, you know, that standard input or that file somehow um, to be able to generate a crash or at least some sort of unexpected behavior. Um, that's all well and good, but AFL sort of, it, 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 it did it in a very sort of non-economical way in that it sort of expected an entire process to be loaded into memory first. So the idea was is that you'd sort of spawn all of your process into memory and, you know, throw in some bit of data see how it reacted and also trace the execution of you know the data you gave it and just see how the program reacted and you record the differences between each successive you know a test case or you know data that the, the fuzz has generated um it has it has things like persistence mode which i'll sort of go into um it also had the notion of what's called a fork server so instead of you know you're not ripping the whole process down every time you're sort of like very quickly respawning it but at the end of the day it's actually sort of really slow compared to um, integrating fuzzing into your uh, sort of software development life cycle now fuzzing is unbelievably powerful if you use it in the software development life cycle things like you know the microsoft sdlc sorry the secure development life cycle so the microsoft secure development life cycle sort of actually has this notion of you know performing automated tests and uh, sort of uh, code checks and fuzzing is, is like one of the most powerful things you can do. So whereas last week I went into, you know, unit tests are there to check things that you think can go wrong. So a really good example I've been using is, you know, you write a field that accepts an email address. Well, part of that email address, you know, you expect to have an at fun you, sorry, you have expect to have an at symbol in there, you know, a .com or a .co.uk domain. You don't expect to have a dollar sign or a pound sign or something like that in there. So what you do is, you know, you write checks to make sure that only a valid amount of characters are sort of allowed. However, if anyone's ever sort of messed around with, you know, cross-site scripting or JavaScript or sort of input validation errors, that doesn't mean that there's not some edge case where you can escape the data and, you know, that edge case can cause a bug. Now, fuzzing, you know, whereas unit test is checking, think, you know, ways that you think it can go wrong, fuzzing sort of does the op. It sort of does it. It's it's related, but it sort of does the opposite. It, it checks the things that you don't know will go wrong, things that you can't think about, or you know, you you can't, you know, necessarily won't ever think about. You know, I've I've <laughs> I've I've taken courses on things, um, sort of symbolic execution and sort of mathematically solving programs, and you know, see me in a seasoned, way more seasoned vulnerability researcher and core source code reviewer couldn't even tell the difference and but you know automated tools can test you know every iteration and they can actually check to see if there's a problem and fuzzing is brilliant for this so so one of the ones i saw the two i spoke about is um clang and hong fuzz and i really want to make the point that i sort of see afl more as a vulnerability researching tool you know if you sort of want to integrate it and you know both of these tools can essentially do the same as each other given you've got the source code However, the sort of key big difference is I see AFL, like I said before, 
hazard vulnerability research at all. It's sort of easier to work out the box, it's quicker, um, whereas things like libfuzzer and, you know, hongfuzz, you know, let's say hongfuzz is more what I would expect, um, sort of, inter, you know, integration into software to use, you know, say within um, the SDLC or within, you know, when you're sort of doing all your testing. Hongfuzz is sort of in the middle. You can use it generally for both sort of um, vulnerability research and as a developer. Whereas, you know, AFL at the end of the day, I see it very much as, you know, it's a much simpler tool to get to grips with. Um, it's probably the better way to put it. However, there's a couple of down downfalls with that. Number one, it can be a bit faffy to get AFL working because you've either got to already have a program that accepts a file or standard input or you've got to write a test harness around it to do this and you know th there's a chance that when you're sort of creating this data or creating these read files that you introduce a bug yourself and they could be sufficiently complex libfuzzer on the other hand ca you can use it for vulnerability research but what tends to happen is that when you have sort of networking functions um this is where things like afl fall down so you know you have some sort of socket that's listening and afl will want to um you essentially want to put data into the socket to see how the program reacts but there's a huge amount of state especially in my like you know my experience with embedded systems unbelievable amount of state that first needs to be there before you can actually you know even get to the point where you fuzz it so, you know number one can you build it under a compiler well, actually number one can you build it number two can you build it under um one of the sort of fuzzing compilers number three you know can you find a way to you know create the state correct in memory and on disk or you know sort of in the operating system and then you know number finally number four can you actually pass data into it and can you do it in an iterative way now things like libfuzzer work really well for software teams because you understand the code right you understand it when you write a unit test you can add the llvm fuzzer test one input interface which i'll go into and you know very easily be able to integrate this and tools such as OSS fuzz and cluster fuzz by Google, you know, you can sort of take the projects yourself and actually create an entire fuzzing environment and then it can sort of do all this as well. So basically, what I say to developers is this if you don't want to fuzz or test your source code, I'll happily do it for you in production. You know, I'll I'll find a zero day in your product and at the end you know, at the end of the day, you know, you guys have to pay out bug bounties and you still need to fix the bug. Um, so my sort of point that I make to developers a lot of the time is, is this is a really good way of pre preventing those sort of zero days in the first instance. It's a really good way of making sure that, you, you know, your software quality is, you know, highly improved. It's all automated, which is particularly nice. And it's really powerful for the developers because, you know, you understand it. Like, because like I said, at the end of the day, if you don't find the bug, I'm going to go find the bug. And, you know, if I don't find the bug, there's a potential that some malicious hacker can find the bug. And then you're talking about things like reputational damage. And, you know, just sort of like lost confidence and, you know, actual liability in some circumstances, depending on what the software is doing. So things like Clang and, you know, Hong Fuzz can, are incredibly powerful for people to actually adopt them sort of in their uh, sort of SDLC. And they're not that hard to get, you know, they're, they're largely automated and they're not that hard to sort of um, get up and working once you sort of understand it. And it's, it's a law of diminishing returns as well. It's like the more bugs they find in the first instance, because typically I find a huge amount of bugs, you know, when I first start attacking software. And, you know, a week later when they fixed it, or a month later when the developers have fixed it, you know, the bugs become much more difficult. And that's that's essentially what you want. Anyway, enough about sort of my background of it. The one thing I sort of wanted to show you is the, um, you know, wanted to go through my notes is with the LLVM Fuzz Test on Input Interface. So if I just switch over to my operating system, sorry, my fuzzing system, one thing I wanted to show you if it decides to load, because it seems to have just crashed. I don't really know why. Oh, there we go. If I just go into CD code, I believe it was libfuzzer. I'll just make it. And if I go into my test CPP function here, so this is the sort of standardized LLVM fuzzer test one input sort of interface. So this here is a symbol that the developers define in their source code and the only thing and so this is called by the fuzzer underlying fuzzer so you've got to imagine that you know when you write a program normally you normally have some sort of function that you have to write so you know that's typically main that the compiler will go and look for well this is basically the same in a way 
that you know main main is an entirely arbitrary construct you know you don't actually need a main in software at all at the same time in this circumstance llvm for a test one input just think of it as like main you know in main you actually if i just draw it out for you it's like you know if i was going to write a, a main function here i might expect you know an int arg c function on argument count or a, you know a char argv uh, argument vector right and then you know that's my main function so the compiler is going to come along and look for the string main and it's going to say oh you know what i'm going to do the compiler when the code runs is eventually it's going to you know run my main function and it's going to pass in an arg c an arg v and something called an environment pointer but you know most people don't put it on there well llvm fuzzer test will input is you know pretty similar to how that works is that the fuzzer instead you know it's it's going to be a bit of code but it's going to be a fuzzed by a fuzzing binary but this time instead of looking for main the compiler is going to be looking for llvm fuzzer test one input and instead of passing arg c it's going to pass in data and instead of passing arg v it's going to pass in size now data is very is exactly the same as you know when afl accepts a file um to you know for a test case this is this is data so whereas in afl you would you know it would load a file or you use a program to load a file and then pass in the test case you know as a file or you'd pass it in the standard input well, the sort of fuzzing interface LLVM fuzzer test one input, you know, gives you a data buffer, and then that size is the size of this data buffer. Now, you don't always need to use the size. I mean, it, it's passed just for brevity reasons and to make sure that you're not causing a problem. Because you know, there is there's legitimate cases where um, you might not be able to, you know, this this function might never be called if this data has nothing in it. There might be another check around it, but I've not sort of included that here. So, you know, this f function, you know, even though it might, you know, cause a bug by this, you know, having absolutely no data in it, you know, a zero length buffer or whatever, it might legitimately never be called in the program because somewhere higher up in the program, um, it actually never sort of gets called in that state. So we pass in this size value. So I can, you know, it's a legitimate test case that, you know, this function here can say, hey, I'm going to give you you know, a buffer with, you know, 10 million characters in it, or I'm going to give you a buffer with zero characters in it just to see how the program reacts. However, in certain circumstances, that might not actually be a valid case. You know, it might actually be impossible for this thing to ever get called with a zero length buffer. And if we know that, this is what we use the size for. We just make sure that there's at least one byte in that size before it gets passed here. Or it could be less than four bytes. It could be, you know, whatever specified in the program. But that's what the interface is for. So every time I said last week, you know, AFL reads, you know, passes in the uh, data or the test case or the fuzz case via, you know, a, a, you know, a file, it reads a file, or it reads standard input. Well, in this case, we've got LLVM fuzzer test one input, which essentially replaces main for all intensive purposes and passes in some data and the size. So I've, you know, created a pseudo function that we're going to fuzz here. Um, and, you know, the fuzz is going to give me some data and then I'm just going to pass that data into this called function. So, you know, I've also I've made it the, the I've made the prototype the same and the function signature here to be the same as what's passed in here. But at the end of the day, you know, we're just taking some data, passing it into a function. And then when you compile this, all of that nice instrumented code and all of the sort of fuzzing stuff, you know, will all just be handled for you. And all it will do, all the fuzzer will do is each time it'll get to this point, it'll give you a new bit of data, send it into the function and test to see, you know, has it generated a new code path or, you know, has it crashed or has something else happened like that. And it'll just do this over and over and over again until it finds a crash. So one thing I sort of wanted to go through here and especially on the notes is this notion of this LLVM fuzzer, in, what fuzzer, LLVM fuzzer test on input and where it comes from. So I sort of, I alluded last week that, well, I didn't sort of allude. I, I, I went through the, you know, high level compilation process in my notes. So, you know, here we've got Clang. C Lang is the, you know, C language compiler, part of LLVM. That's where the LLVM comes from. And the idea is, is that, you know, I've got, this is exactly sort of the same thing that we've written on here. So the, there's some function here, you know, call, let's call it lib in this, you know, in the, on screen before it was called call function that we're loading from some sort of uh, source code file. So this is my sort of, uh, library file can't write library properly um, and you know this is exposing some sort of API interface to me and you know I, I want to use it you know let's say for all intents and purposes it's you know an XML parsing function we normally have sort of we normally expect to write source code you know with a main in it as I sort of said 
However, in this case, we still have a main, but it's sort of, you know, it's included later in the compiler. So what Clang will do is instead, you know, normally what Clang will do is it'll read your source code file, it'll look for a main symbol, and if it finds a main symbol, you know, it will add a bit of sort of code on the front and the end of the program, and I'll explain that in a second, but it'll look for main, and then, you know, this it'll actually call into your, into your function. However, in this case, you know, this is our test harness, so, you know, when you see LLVM for as a test on input here, that, you know, this is our actual, you know, test harness here. And that essentially, LLVM for as a test on input, you know, replaces this main function. And, you know, we just pass in data. So when we're doing the compile, you know, we've got some library here that we want to fuzz. Um, and this, you know, and then the compiler is going to come down here and we write a test case. Sorry, this is a library we want to fuzz. It's got all the instrumentation on it because when we compile it in this state, all the instrumentation will be added automatically. And we have some sort of, you know, test harness down here. So we compile this code, have a test harness, and Clang, you know, inserts all of the sort of gubbins for, you know, managing that LLVM for the test run input in interface. This can get a bit wacky, um, particularly because, you know, compiler theory is, is very difficult. But, you know, here is, you know, here's sort of what I said every time is, is you know, the only job of a compiler um, is to, you know, take source code on the right hand side here, which can be a .c file, a Java file, or a .js file. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interpret, you know, I'm thinking of just in time compilers, as is the case with JavaScript, as actual compilers. But you know, sort of at a higher level, the only job of a compiler is, you know, what it's to do is to take source code that humans can understand, you know, push it into this magic compiler, and you know, out pops a binary file you know, an ELF file or, you know, a .exe file. And that's the only job of a compiler. You take source code humans can read, push through compiler, out comes a binary, something we can read. You know, could be it could be a library file as well. But, you know, that sort of uh, doesn't matter so much for us, for our sort of purposes. Anyway, so here's me sort of redrawing it here just to sort of show you what happens with main. So, you know, we've got some sort of source code file in here. And, you know, we've got, you know, we've got a main function in here, let's say. You know, somewhere in here is a main function and that tells the compiler that you know when we you know take this source code you know c javascript whatever and push it into the compiler is that it's going to look for this main function and then it's going to call you know call the actual function to, to run our code so you know we take the source code file push it into the compiler you know da -da 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 -da, push it down here and this is the actual binary now here's the thing that people don't understand or sort of I'm saying don't understand but don't know is that the first code run in a binary isn't actually main main doesn't actually have to exist you know all the symbol main doesn't actually have to exist and these strings as well are only for our recognition you know the computer doesn't actually need to you know know that this is you know underscore start if you've ever done assembly this underscore start will be um, quite familiar to you but anyway i'll just explain it now so like i said you know typically you write a main function push it in a compiler it writes a binary and we think of the main as the first instance of you know when our code gets executed and that's not true and as i showed you in the function before you have these three parameters you've got an argument count alxy an argument vector and um, this is the list of strings on the command line that you pass in an environment an environmental pointer but at the end of the day like you know what which code actually you know passed these into our main function so you know these seem need to be coming from somewhere and the operating system needs to know where to grab these and it needs to be able to push them into our program so what actually happens is you know when we push this ask main source code through a compiler the compiler actually adds on a little bit of sort of stuff at the beginning let's just highlight it here so it adds on a little bit of stuff at the beginning here and it adds a little bit of stuff on the end here so this here the start of this if you use the function um if you oh, it's read elf dash h i'll just show you that on the screen quickly you can uh, you can actually see this working so if I just come out here, oops, and you know we've got this, you know, test file here. Oh, that actually is a fuzzer. Uh, let's do read elf dash h. And what you can see here is there's an entry point address. So remember this four one. I'll write it down on here. Uh, so zero x four one e490 you know this is our example that is the entry point this is on the note so you guys will sort of see it or 
underscore start, which is sort of the you know human convention. So if we remember that value, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run this under GDB. Uh, so what was it? Test. Let's just run it. Let's run it in quiet mode. I'm going to put a breakpoint on that function that we just copied, right? Let me just switch to assembly mode. Anyway, so we see we're not running the program yet, so don't think that this is the start of the program. It's not actually executing yet. But this, you know, this value here is, you know, where main actually is in our binary. But if you paste that value here, that is not the same value. So when we first run, you know, hit that binary, we don't actually run main. We run something before it. So if I, you know, if I just hit run, because we put a breakpoint, it stops in start, right? So this is actually the first thing that gets run in our binary. And, you know, if I sort of step through here a few times, we can see that there's actually code executing before main gets executed, which is really interesting. Um, so if I just step in here, what's interesting is now we've gone from what's called start, underscore start, if I just do a backtrace there. So we've gone from um, underscore start was the first thing that we executed, which was, you know, that's where it called this. So the entry point existed just before here. And then we've called into this, you know, you know, underscore underscore libc start main function. Well, however, what's really interesting, and I want you to take a note out here, so I'm not sure if you noticed this from the beginning, but this is the actual function prototype for libc start main. And I've put symbols on and sort of included the source code just to make it a bit simpler. But what the first argument when we call this libc start main function is actually the address of main. So what happens sort of under GDB, oh sorry, under uh, compilers, is if I just go back to my desk here, is when you know this goes through the compiler here and it comes down to the binary, is the start, this little symbol here, start, is the first thing that gets executed, right? And this, you know, this this isn't actually anything that we've added. This is what the compiler adds. So I said before and I showed you is that, you know, it calls start when we run the binary. That's what the compiler added. And then it jumps into libc start main. Um, and then finally, what you should see, you know, during this process is we'll actually, you know, eventually call into main and continue executing. So when we use main, it's not the first code executed. It's the first code that we've written that gets executed because the compiler adds stuff on the beginning. It also adds stuff on the end. And I sort of demonstrated this with people as well. So if I just sort of exit out here, I mean, I'll just sort of write the uh, main address down here, which was... Uh, 0x472540 that's main if I show you here at the end remember I wrote here is it it adds some gubbins on the start and at the end as well so like when you return from the function is you'll actually have some data returned by the program and what's really interesting actually I'll show you this first before I sort of go into it so if I go back to the sort of um, this here and I just write a really quick uh, actually, uh, ret.c, just write a really quick bit of code, include stdi.h, int main, int, oh, I'll write the whole argument out as well, char rb, char, uh, char environment pointer, and then all I'm going to do from here, so I'm going to return zero, right? Typically, if you've ever seen it, you'll see this will return true, will return, you know, uh, success or something. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build that with Clang. Let's build ret. Can't type it properly. Push out ret. And I'm not sure if people know, but you can actually print the um, return codes of you know functions that you know execute correctly or you know error out in uh, Linux by typing echo dollar sign question mark. So if I hit that, it tells me that the last thing I you know I called, which was Clang ret zero ret was zero and zero means success. So if I can demonstrate this by typing, uh, let's just do grep r dot, uh, actually that's probably not a good idea, is it? I just type echo hello, right? And then I read you know, the result of that program, that's all fine. But let's say I just add some really weird characters on the end. It actually echoed it, that wasn't very sensible. Um, <laughs> uh, let me try and think of another command. Let's do a find, but just add some really odd stuff in here. This should cause an error. Now it says, "Oh, there's been some sort of error," which means that if we, you know, if we look at the echo now, we're going to see another value in there. If this means success, then one means there's been an error, and you can actually write this into your code. So if I just come back to ret here and I change this to 
no, one, recompile it, and then run it again. Remember, I've changed the code to one. If I just, you know, didn't want to go too quick. I've changed the return from zero to one. I come back out here. I recompile it under clang. Then I run that. And now if we just look at echo again, it's one. But, you know, that could be an error. So let's come in here and just write something really odd, like 33 or whatever, 31. That's fine. Come back here. Recompile it. Run it. Have a look at the return code, which we specified. It's 31. Which means that we're actually telling, you know, that we're telling something that when it returns, that needs to, you know, return this actual value. And the place that value gets returned to, as I sort of was sort of alluding to before, I was telling you about, is that, you know, this is our main code. We're writing return in this bit here, sort of right at the end of our actual main function here. We're accepting functions here from, you know, this bit here in this code at the end. And we're returning it, and this code at the end is a, is what's responsible for actually adding that value, the return value, into the operating system, and you know, into the bash prompt as we saw it. Now, what's actually doing this, you know, adding this code at the beginning and the end, is libc. So if you ever see libc at anywhere, this is one of the functions of libc, is it does all this sort of things, and this is what the compiler does. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's actually you know the function of it. It also adds a bunch of. Um, it adds a bunch of sort of other, you know, function calls like printf as well. But one of the things it does do, if you go into sort of like the libc project, is you'll see a bunch of sort of symbols and sort of other assembly here, which sets up all this, you know, all this sort of functionality as well. And what you will always see on Linux especially, is you'll also always have some sort of um, C library that's called, you know, when you execute code. So in this case, if I just do ldd, which will tell me which, you know, um, which uh, libraries are getting called, and you know, I run that ret function. What we can see here is we have this thing called Linux VDSO dot shared objects. Remember, shared objects are like DLL but for Linux. Uh, the VDSO is a quick, fast hook into the Linux kernel if you need to do syscalls. We've got LD Linux here, um, which is the sort of dynamic loader that helps you sort of load all the program up, but at the same time. We've got libc.so.6, and you know I didn't actually include any sort of libc code. So something, you know, from libc has been, you know, included here. And as I showed you before, one of those functions was libc start main, um, and that's basically one of the main responsibilities of libc is it adds all of this sort of gubbins around your code to make sure it can execute. Now that was a really big tangent for me to go on off, uh, sort of go off there. But I just sort of wanted to show you that, that that's sort of like where symbols come from. So when I say, you know, main, sorry, main is the, you know, symbol that we typically think is, the, you know, the first bit of code. It doesn't need to be. That's just a convention under libc. You know, we can change the name of, you know, this to something else and just say compiler instead of looking for main. Look for, you know, pain or look for LLVM fuzz or test one input. It doesn't really matter. But, you know. I just sort of wanted to make the notion that this is incredibly arbitrary. So don't think that main, you know, always has to be there. And, you know, assembly programmers don't often write, a, you know, a main sort of symbol in there. And especially if symbols have been stripped out, you're not going to see a main anyway. So it's completely arbitrary. It's just code. Remember, main is just our convention. So is that LLVM for a test on input. Anyway, sort of on to the clang bit of the sort of, sort of what I was talking about. So... If we have this LLVM fuzzer test on input test harness here, sort of what's different about AFL is this is what I sort of wanted to allude to. So remember I said that, you know, let's say this is our .c source code on the side here, you know, our .c source code. Um, you know, it goes through some sort of compiler. Um, Clang, you know, actually looks for this LLVM fuzzer test on input here. This C gets compiled down into, you know, a binary. And remember the stuff here between these sort of blocks on the beginning and end this is like, you know, our main code. This is the bit of code we've written. And, you know, at the same time, you know, we have a bit of code added by libc at the beginning and a bit of code added by libc at the end. Now, the sort of the difference that I sort of alluded to and sort of tried to describe with AFL is like, you know, let's say this is an entire, um, like duct tape, for instance, that we did last week. This is an entire binary that's, you know, reads a file, executes some code and does some tracing. So what we're going to have to do in sort of, you know, layman's terms in AFL is you load up the entire process as is, you know, you send in some sort of file here, it executes through this entire program, it may crash, it may exit early, but you know, each time you've got to load this entire program up with the fork server in AFL, but either way, you've sort of got to set up and do all this initialization. And this causes a problem, this is very, very slow, and it can be a bit problematic, and it's not very good to integrate in your code, because you know, 
sometimes you know i've worked with devices that can take five minutes to sort of come up properly and if you want to do one test case every five minutes it doesn't work very well so the sort of way you use things like clang and you know this llvm fuzz a test run input is you know we actually let's say these green bits here i would like to call critical functions this might be you know you know username uh, sort of checker this here might be you know you know uh, waiting for a web socket to do some snmp traffic you know this thing here could be doing some sort of license check this could be some sort of uh, type length value parsing function but the difference is is whereas with afl we were sort of like holistically attacking the whole thing at once you know in this case what we're doing is when you write a fuzzer you don't need to fuzz all code I mean, I mean, ideally you would in a perfect world, but, you know, we can't do everything. What you would do is you'd pick, like, some, you know, quite critical functions in the same way that you use unit tests and make sure, you know, that these functions here are the ones that are more likely to go wrong, especially if they do, you know, TLV parsing or sort of any sort of reading of data or, or sort of trying to understand data in any way, is what you do is you sort of pull out these bits of code, like, like this instance here. So let's say that this is a TLV parser. Oh, sorry, yeah, TLV parser. This is this bit of green code here in there is you know what's going to take in data from somewhere and read it and try and attempt to understand it and you know break it down and this is where bugs sort of typically occur. It, so what we're doing is we're taking it out in isolation. We're only attacking like that one function or that one sort of bit of functionality in the program. We're not loading the entire thing up and we can do this like with multiple you know different functions. So this could be a TLV parser. This might be like a username checker. This might be a socket listener. But each the point is is that whereas AFL we loaded the whole program because we have access to the core source code and we are the developers of the source code hopefully um, you're doing it in this sense now that's not to say that like I said before libfuzz and hongfuzz and AFL can be made to like you know work in the same way and sort of look the same but in this circumstance using the LLVM fuzzer test on input interface which you know hongfuzz uses and you know clang uses and libfuzzer uses is much simpler to attack individual functions. So, you know, think of these as unit tests. In a unit test, you're typically testing, like, one thing. You know, in this case, we'd write an LLVM for a test one input for, like, one function we want to test. So, you know, this, you might, you might have the same here. The red is the, you know, remember, this the bits at the beginning and the end here, what libc has added in the, you know, the bit in the middle, um, you know, the highlighted bit in the middle is what we've written, like our main function. As you know, that's, so, you know, this bit here might be, that might be a unit test, right? So for, for every critical function in the code now, or critical functionality, it could be several functions, is we're writing a fuzz you know, a fuzz test harness in green. At the same time, we're also writing a unit test. And you always need, I think you always really need both for critical functions, you know. So we're testing really quickly, you know, can we exceed the bounds of what we think it can exceed? However, at the same time, you know, over the weekend or during the build or sort of just, you know, ongoing, we're still, we're just hitting this function as best, you know, as much as we can with stuff. And people like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google especially use this hugely to their advantage. And what they do is they, uh, you know, they, they, you know, the really nice thing about this as well is that what you know I alluded to before is that AFL, you know, loads the whole binary in some sort of way. It doesn't need to, but you know, generally does. Where you know, is this time we're doing really small bits of code. And the really good thing about this is that we can actually parallelize all of this stuff in the middle. So what Google do is they is a good example is they. They run, you know, t you know, hundreds of thousands, say hundreds of thousands, or tens of thousands of test cases, like per second, for like, you know, hundreds of, you know, parallelized by, you know, a thousand times or something. So they're able to like, you know, build the entire of Chromium, pick out individual critical bits of Chromium, like a JavaScript parser or you know, like the any anything that takes input, you know, write a unit test against it, write a fuzzer against it, and you're able to just hit go. Now Google, you know, this is only the sort of fuzzing bit. Google have this sort of whole architecture and infrastructure around doing that to help developers, you know, do it faster. But this is why one of the reasons why things like Microsoft, uh, sorry, Windows and you know Word and like Internet Explorer, Chrome, it's like it's so hard to find bugs in it because they've sort of integrated all of this process. That's not to say bugs don't exist; they definitely do exist. But it's much harder, and you know, the bug bounties are much higher for this sort of higher quality source code. And, you know, if everyone's sort of code was like this, you know, hackers and bad people would have a really difficult time. So integrating this, like, into your sort of business is unbelievably powerful. Um, I think I've got one more page left. Um, yeah, so I wrote this down. It was sort of wasn't pertinent to what I was saying, but it was a question that was asked. So the question was, can you do this within other languages? And the answer is yes. Um, but there is one sort of problem 
um, with it is that uh, so, you know let's say that I'm, I sort of wanted to draw this as well actually so I'm just going to sort of draw this down at the bottom I'm just going to say this is the CPU right CPU so this is sort of like a really <laughs> high level overview of what a stack would look like so at the bottom we've got like CPU or hardware which is our actual computer or laptop or phone and then we've sort of got you know the PC uh, sort of the operating system on top of it you know your Windows your Linux your iOS your Androids your VxWorks, whatever it is, which is the software that's actually sort of interacting with the CPU, remember it's the middle layer. And, you know, the question was, is can you fuzz a Python f file? And the answer is yes. Now, you're not going to get, hopefully, memory corruption bugs in the same way that, you know, you would, um, you know, f if it wasn't in an interpreted language like Python or, you know, JavaScript, like in C. Um, but you can still get bugs such as logical errors. Um, it takes a bit more work to sort of understand them, but one of the, you know, or an infinite loop, you know, infinite loops can happen in any program. And I said last week that, you know, Alan Turing proved there's no general way to be able to tell whether or not a program halts or, you know, runs forever or actually will eventually stop. Like it's impossible. And it's really, and so, so like things like Python and JavaScript, you know, not just logical bugs, are um, also susceptible to things like you know infinite loops or sort of errors like that. I wouldn't expect you to get a memory corruption bug. And there's a bit of a problem with this sort of thing that I. This is why you see in C plus plus as an example because we start getting into a lot of nuances with it. And you know I have fuzzed Python, I've fuzzed JavaScript for various reasons and tested it. Um, now one of the sort of issues is that if I wanted to you know f you know fuzz this Python file here. I only, you know, as a developer of the Python script, I only care about, you know, this Python file that I'm writing, which might be for the web or it might be for the Rocket system. However, the problem is, is because there's a just-in-time com compiler, is at the end of the day, they don't. it doesn't run on its own. It doesn't run in isolation, as you would have thought, you know, more like C would. What's actually happening is that this Python file is being interpreted, compiled on the fly in the actual Python binary. So as I'm sort of changing, in, you know, changing code throughout here, I'm also executing code within the Py3 binary on the system. And this can cause a problem in, am I actually just fuzzing the Python bind, a Python file that I've created as a developer? Because I don't care so much. You know, obviously I care, but it's not my job to fix bugs in Python itself. I only want to fix bugs, bugs, in, bugs in my Python, py.py file. Problem is, is, let's say, you know, there is a bug with Python and you know, I'm fuzzing it in here. You know, how do I know that there's a bug within the Py file or it's a bug within Python? You know, and if there is a memory corruption that crashes, then it's definitely within Python. But then, what can I do about it? You know, you can go and do a bug report, but you know, there's not, you know, not in every circumstance is that sort of, you know, possible. So you sort of have to have like a sort of better understanding. And fuzzers do exist for this type of thing. They just sort of operate at a high level. Um, but it sort of alludes to a sort of a point of abstraction that I was making, is that you go, oh yeah, right. Well, you know, I, I want to fuzz a .py file, but the problem is, is you'd also be fuzzing the Python file. But at the same time, like when you're actually running a fuzzer normally, because I said that if, you know, if I say that, you know, C just runs on bare metal, right? Or it can run on bare metal. So, you know, we've got a .c file here. Is that the difference being is that, you know, Pi is running on Python, which is running on a computer and operating system. But, you know, when I run a C file, I'm also technically fuzzing the underlying kernel because that's also executing code. Now it might not be doing tracing, you know this, you know this thing here might not be doing tracing, but fundamentally, you know, this here could just crash, right? Because I've done something, you know, done something wrong, and this is one of the ways that people use to actually find bugs in the kernel. And then there's an even more sort of abstract sort of point that you need to make as well, is that, um, you know, if you do fuzz a kernel, let's say the kernel's down here at this level, well, you also have bugs in the CPU. So, like, you know, there's loads of sort of microcode instructions that people, you know, find and discover that, you know, shouldn't be there or should be there. And then, you know, how do we know if I'm fuzzing the kernel? And, you know, it's not a bug in the CPU. So you've always got this problem of, you know, this always, like, layer of abstraction you need to worry about. Um, you know, and the same as with Python, the same as with JavaScript. So, you know, are you attacking the Py file, which is what your developers or you as a developer have to worry about? Are you, you know, attacking the Python file? You know, are you also, you know, attacking the operating system? Or are you attacking the CPU and the sort of an underlying hardware? And I've, I've got experience, like, like individually attacking all of these things or like as an entire stack. But you've sort of got to really focus your efforts on, you know, what you have responsibility for. Um, as a vulnerability researcher, my job is to look at sort of all of these together, you know, in certain settings and sort of understand the nuanced difference 
But if you're just a software house, you've really got to understand and find a fuzzer that only attacks this .py file, not the Python, even though it will be fuzzing the Python technically. Um, but you sort of only want to worry about the instrumentation at this level and, you know, not further down. Anyway, that sort of just concludes the notes. And I sort of, I just didn't, I didn't really say this before. And I sort of, I said it a few times, but did make the point is um, this LLVM fuzzer test one input here. I said, I said it works for libfuzzer. You know, that's what it, that's sort of where it started. LLVM fuzzer. So it was, a, the, it was the LLVM fuzzer, right? Libfuzzer. Um, LLVM being the project it being a fuzzer it's like test one input we only want to test one input at a time now it turns out that that's all you need to actually um, test loads of different inputs so I, I won't go into that until next week because it can get a bit funky and people sort of don't really understand very well unless it's explained slowly um, but you know this isn't just libfuzzer this is like almost a pseudo standardized way to write fuzzers now you know that's how libfuzzer works well, Hongfuzz also, you know, accepts this LLVM fuzzer test on input sort of interface. And this is how you write test harnesses for Hongfuzzer as well. Um, you know, and, and many other fuzzers that sort of are coming out, uh, you know, as time goes on. But sort of understanding the nuance of this, and, you know, there is a difference between sort of the way AFL works and, you know, you also have access to this LLVM fuzzer test on input interface. It sort of is where it becomes really powerful. And as I said, this week was more about people that want to integrate fuzzing as like you know automated code analysis so you still do your static code analysis at the same time you can use this for vulnerability researching but i really believe this is most powerfully used by um, actual developers themselves whereas afl is more about vulnerability researchers and as i always say all of them can do each other's job you know given the right parameters but you know this is a tool that was sort of built more for the actual software development secure development life cycle anyway have a good day